Hey everyone, welcome to Strange Fire. Today we're going to look at Strange Fire in a variety of different topics, and that begins right now. A month or so ago, I was surfing the internet when I came across an offer I couldn't refuse. It was an offer to have a free Book of Mormon shipped to me. And I thought, hey, I'll take that. I mean, I can use that in the ministry, and that's one Book of Mormon that I won't have to pay for. And I figured, well, considering all the tithing that I have paid, I had at least one coming, right? So I filled out the form, gave them my mailing address, clicked send, and it wasn't very long before the phone rang. And it was a, a Mormon missionary, a sister missionary by the name of Chloe. She was a, a very nice person, very, very cordial, very friendly. Uh, and, and I believe that she is and was incredibly sincere in the things that she was doing. So I don't want to be critical of Chloe. It was interesting to me that the offer wasn't so much an offer for a free Book of Mormon, but that instead it was a way for missionaries like Chloe to call and, <laughs> and sneak in a first missionary discussion, even when people don't know that it's happening. She indicated that she was calling to confirm my mailing address, but, but that soon led to a discussion. And I have to admit that I wasn't as forthcoming about my knowledge of Mormonism as maybe I should have been. She asked me if I had any questions, and I thought, well, what single question can I ask Chloe that might become a seed, might become something that will puzzle her, trouble her, until she actually finds the courage to seek the truth herself. I told her, yes, I do have a question. You see, in the Book of Mormon, 1 Nephi chapter 13, it says that the Bible was the pure word of God until after the death of the apostles. And so that would be uh, the death of Jesus Christ plus, what, another 70 years, 80 years, you know, something like that, I don't know. but but until after Jesus and his original 12 were all dead. And, and the Book of Mormon then says that the Bible, which was pure and perfect, fell into the hands of the great and abominable church. That's the name the Book of Mormon gives the Christian church. It says that it was a corrupt church, that it was a church founded by the devil, and that its only purpose was to lead people to hell. And it says that while the Bible was in the hands and in the control of the great and abominable church, that many plain and precious things were lost and that the whole Bible became corrupted to the point that Joseph Smith had to write the article of faith that says, we believe the Bible to be the word of God as far as it is translated correctly. And the problem is that among the Mormons, no one seems to know where the correct and incorrectly translated portions of the Bible are, and so it makes the whole Bible untrustworthy. So anyway, this is the claim of the Book of Mormon that the Bible, as we know it today, is a corrupt mess. Joseph Smith, in the years leading up to his death, began to retranslate the Bible. He, he rewrote the Bible without benefit of, of manuscripts or any ancient records. He was just, you know, out of his head, I guess, out of his hat, out of somewhere. Anyway, he rewrote the Bible, and he rewrote many parts of Isaiah. And everything was still good, because they were saying that this new Joseph Smith Bible is the correct Bible, and there was nothing to prove Joseph Smith wrong until 1947, when they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls. With the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, they actually found scrolls that cover virtually the entire Old Testament. And Isaiah was represented perfectly. As they opened the scroll of Isaiah, which was dated some 200 years before Christ died, they found, well, what, what should have they found? If Mormonism is true, they should have found that the Isaiah scroll, as they unrolled and read it, they should have found that it perfectly matched the Joseph Smith Bible, but in fact, they found just the opposite. They found that that ancient manuscript perfectly matches the Isaiah that's in my Bible and yours. So the church had a problem. You see, the Dead Sea Scrolls are dated before the death of the apostles. Therefore, 
The Dead Sea Scrolls must be the pure and true Word of God. Therefore, the Joseph Smith Bible is not correct. And that would make Joseph Smith a false prophet. So they had uh, some damage control to do. In the, the Mormon Bible, which is actually the King James Bible, with the addition of Joseph Smith's translations, there is also a Bible dictionary. And in the Bible dictionary, we read, the Dead Sea Scrolls, some of which are believed to be as early as the second century BC, give evidence that the Old Testament text was corrupted at least by that time. Let me paint this picture, make sure you understand it. Without benefit of this statement in the Mormon Bible Dictionary, the Mormons have a problem in that. The Book of Mormon says the Bible, at the time that the Dead Sea Scrolls were written, was pure and correct and perfect. And yet, instead of matching the Joseph Smith Bible, which was supposed to be the corrected Bible, it matched our Bibles. And so they put this statement in the Bible Dictionary, but this creates another problem. If the Bible was truly corrupted 200 years before Christ was born, then that makes the Book of Mormon in error. You see, the Book of Mormon says that there was no corruption until after the death of the apostles, and now, 200 years before the apostles were even born, they are saying that there is corruption. The, the church on this one has a real big problem in that, that either the Joseph Smith Bible or the Book of Mormon must be corrupt. They cannot both be correct. With that statement, the Book of Mormon is proved faulty, and without the statement in the Bible Dictionary, the Joseph Smith Bible is corrupted. So anyway, uh, I shared this with Chloe, and I asked her, please help me understand. Is the Joseph Smith Bible true, or is the Book of Mormon true, or are they both false together? She promised to get back to me in a few weeks, and, and a month went by, and then a month and a half, and two months. and So I called and, le and left a message, and she re returned my call today. As you listen to our conversation, I would like you to focus on the answers that Chloe gives. You see, at one point she says that she's a missionary and that I should know what missionaries are about, and in fact I do. Missionaries are called in their youth, they're called at a time in their life when they know virtually nothing about the gospel of Jesus Christ, when all they know is a little bit of Mormon indoctrination. They are brought into to a mission training center where they spend a few weeks or a few months and while they are there, they learn basic tactics that work if you are speaking with the ignorant. But you see, they don't have answers when they speak with anyone that has any, any amount of biblical understanding. So I'd like you to focus on Chloe's answers, or in fact, actually the, the absence of her answers. <laughs> Is this Lance? Uh huh. Hi, Lance. This is this is Chloe. I'm just returning a call. I thought you called me earlier. I did. I did. Actually, we talked. We talked. Well, probably six weeks ago, and you were going to get back to me. Yes. I remember. I actually. I remembered. Um, I connected with somebody who's from your hometown. She's serving in the same mission as me. Mm hmm. Her name, do you know, um, what was her name? Oh. Yeah, uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, Sharon, Sharon, Shannon, not Sharon, Shannon. Yep, I, yeah, I have connected with her and I I just never given you the time to call back. I'm sorry about that. Okay. Well, I, yeah, yeah I actually wanted to reach back to you because... Because neither one of us were really completely honest with each other. Yeah, uh -huh. uh, we we were not honest because I'd already left my address, and you said you needed to call and confirm it so we so you could talk to me and stuff. But I wasn't honest either. Three years ago, I was in the high priest group leadership here, and the truth is, there are a thousand questions that you can't answer, and I'd really like to talk to you about them. And that one, 
that says that the that the Bible was corrupted 200 years before Christ, that even makes Jesus a liar. Because Jesus opened the Bible to the book of Isaiah in the synagogue in Nazareth, and he, annou- he read from that to announce the beginning of his ministry. And so if 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 what your leaders have put in your Bible dictionary is true, then Jesus stood there and lied when he announced his ministry. And, and, and I would just love to talk with you because I, I won't tell you what to believe. I would just ask you questions, and I can give you a new question every day for six months that you can't answer. And if you can't answer, then you don't have the truth. But where does, where does faith come in? Huh? Where does faith come in? What about faith? Well, faith is a very interesting thing. You see, the Bible says over and over that... That if you go strictly by your heart, which is deceitful and easily uh, manipulated, that that alone isn't 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 enough. It says John said we have to test every spirit. Moses said we have to test every prophet. Uh, uh, Paul, the apostle Paul, said even if an angel from heaven comes and teaches you a gospel that's different, uh, they, they must be accursed. And so the the, the simple truth is. Faith is an important thing, but you have to know what you believe in. Because you don't even know which Jesus you believe in, do you? I, I do. I know what Jesus I believe in. <laughs> okay, then what, can I ask you a couple questions? Actually, I'm, I'm, wait, 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 wait. I'm not looking to wait, 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 a minute, no. wait a minute. I'm just going to ask you questions about Jesus. I'm not going to argue with you. What? That's okay, ma'am. I'm okay. But I, I appreciate you calling no, me. I, I, I know why you're doing what you're doing, because you know that I'm going to ask you questions about Jesus that you can't answer, like, like, like Brigham Young saying that Jesus was taken to the cross because he was a polygamist. Or like the title page of your Book of Mormon that says God is the eternal God. But Joseph Smith in the King Fowler Discourse just before he died said that God is not God from eternity to all eternity, he refutes that and takes away the veil. And then he said that he was greater than Jesus. That's in your tr- history of your church. These aren't my statements. These are yours. This isn't my take. It's it's your gospel, and, and you have to own it. And, and all I want is to see you know Jesus. And and I can I can actually define for you right now, and I give you specific references to Mormon documentation a dozen different definitions of Jesus and then I have to ask you which one do you follow because they're all legitimate versions of Jesus but the Jesus of the Bible never changed not from the Pentateuch to Revelation he is always the same and it's a beautiful amazing thing hmm. so, well, I appreciate your your desire to help me with but I actually um I recognize how much the Savior has helped me in my life, and I have loved all the information that I have learned about Him. So which, which, which one is yours? yours? Which one is yours? Okay, okay, well, let's, 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 shift, let's shift gears. That, that matters. Let's shift gears, you know. I We talked a little bit, and then the phone went dead, and I thought, well, Chloe's hung up on me. She doesn't want to talk anymore. I was very surprised when she called back. You see, I think that while Chloe is very much afraid of the truths that she can't deny, I think part of her wants to know these truths. And I think that's why she called back, because it would have been easier and safer for her if she had just let the line go dead and not respond. But anyway, she did call back. And I think it's because she wants to know at one level or another. Well... Hi, Lance. Sorry about that. I think with the the voicemail, my companion was trying to join the, our our conversation, um, and so something something happened. But now we are good. Okay. So am I talking to your companion too? No. Oh no, she wasn't able to. Oh, okay. Well, Chloe, there are just so many things. We talked about many things, and at one point, I talked about the Mormon doctrine that declares that no murderer. No one, in fact, that even sheds innocent blood, which would include any woman who's had an abortion, can find forgiveness in this world or the next. I shared with her the the passages where they can be found in the Doctrine and Covenants, section 42 and also section 132. 
And then I shared with her uh, my personal experience. You see, I know mur a couple of murderers. I know a little bit about their crimes. I know that they were heinous. And I know that they are forgiven. I see the light in their eyes. I see God working through them. And so I have cut this portion of the conversation out of today's webcast because it does identify specific people. And I don't want to do that. But I asked her specifically, how is it that your doctrine denies forgiveness and I see forgiven people on a regular basis? We talked a little bit about what Jesus has done for those who Mormonism claims can never be forgiven. But your gospel says that there is no hope, that they are forever, ever guilty and will never be forgiven in this world or the next. And yet, Chloe, I can guarantee you that they are more free than you or I. It's the most beautiful thing to see. But your doctrine says it's impossible, and I see it every week. How do, how do you answer that when your doctrine says no one can be forgiven a murder? And even while the people are murdering Jesus and they have him on the cross and they're driving nails through his hands and his feet. But more importantly, he's dying for your sin and mine. So we are the murderers too. And he cries out, Father, forgive them. How can they, murderers of God, be forgiven when Mormon doctrine says it's impossible? Hi. Um, yeah, and, 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 and I want to make sure that, that that the sources that you're getting these things from are are correct. And I don't. I honestly, I am so pleased with um, your desire to learn more about Jesus Christ and um, to really make sure that you have a have a strong relationship with Him. And um, if it's okay with you, that I really just love just to to agree to disagree. You have your beliefs and I have mine, but if we're both trying to become better people through Jesus Christ, I feel like that's really what it comes down to. Well, no, 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 no. Your doctrine says, your doctrine says that I cannot be saved. The Joseph, yeah. Smith, the Joseph Smith's first vision says that I am uh, an abomination and corrupt. First Nephi 13, all the way through, says that I go to the church which is head up by Satan. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Uh, Second Nephi somewhere says that I'm I'm a fool and I'm going to hell because I believe in the Bible. These are all things that your doctrine says. But but here's actually here's something that's even more beautiful. My wife and I were married in the Ogden Temple. You there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. We, yeah. We were married in the Ogden Temple, and then we found the truth and. But we were excommunicated, never accused of a sin, only accused of not believing in Mormonism anymore. And uh, and yet you can turn to Doctrine and Covenants 132. I hope you write this down. Doctrine and Covenants 132. I think it's verse 27. It's right there in that neighborhood. And it says, If a man marry a wife according to the new and everlasting covenant and according to my promise that he or she can commit any manner of sin, including all blasphemies, except that they do not murder. And if they do not commit murder, that they will rise in the first resurrection and be exalted as gods and goddesses. All right, here, here we are, my wife and I, voluntarily left that left the church because we know it's not true. And yet your own doctrine, 132, verse 27, I believe, tells us that we, at once having been married in the temple, can never lose our exaltation no matter what we do, as long as we don't kill someone. Does that sound right to you? Hmm. Well, Lance, I, I am looking at the, the scripture right now. Uh-huh. If a man marry a wife... According to the spirit, my spirit of promise, or however, you know, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, obviously, because right? I'm sitting here having lunch. Don't have that in front of me. But it says that we can commit any sin, all manner of sin and all blasphemies, provided that we do not commit murder and shed innocent blood. And we will rise up to our exaltation. Hmm. That's, that's, that, that's interesting, and I... 
um, to not know the answer of all things. I, I'm simply here. I think you know very well of what my purpose is as a missionary, and I feel like um, the things you're trying to do is make me not believe what I believe, and I don't. I don't respect that. No, I'm trying um, to make you believe the truth, but you don't want to because I just gave you the doctrine. It's yours. It's your doctrine. You have to own it. You you have to own it. And and I can go on and on and on. Uh, Brigham Young and and his his first counselor, Jedediah Smith, or Grant, said that Jesus was taken to taken to the cross because he was a polygamist and that offended the Jews. I can send that to you. I can your phone receive texts. Yes, it can. Would, would you like me to send you those quotes that says Jesus was actually married to many women and he was taken to the cross because of his many wives and not because he stood and declared that he was God? That's okay, Lance. You're, you're thoughtful, but I'm okay. I, I know, because what are you doing? You're saying, I don't want the truth. I, I don't want the truth. I want to believe what I want to believe, and I don't want the truth. And But if you don't want the truth, you don't want God. And if you don't want God, Jesus can't save you. That's what he said. I, I view it in this way, Lance, so I, um, I have my own testimony, and I know of, of what I felt and believe to be true, and um, I can believe I, can that I, it's... Can I text you the scriptures that say that if you base your testimony on the things you believe and the things you have felt, that you're a fool and that you're being deceived by the devil, and then I can send you biblical biblical formulas that tell you how to test for lies and truth? Can I send you those? I'm, I'm okay, Lance. I um, would prefer not no longer to have communication with you. I've heard quite the history about you, and um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, all, I'm, okay I'm, I'm, I'm sure you did. I'm sure you did. But the thing is, I haven't given you anything that doesn't come directly from your own books. It's Mormonism that I'm sharing with you. And, and so you're a missionary out there trying to get people to join a church that you don't know anything about. I don't appreciate that, Lance, and I hope you have a good day. Bye. Bye Bye-bye. In closing, I want to point out why I have put this up. You see, I want you to understand how difficult it is to reason with Mormons who have been indoctrinated for the entirety of their life. I want you to understand how frustrating it can be. But I also want you to see that getting angry has no benefit. We simply lay out the truth. We simply ask questions that can't be answered. And these are seeds, seeds that are laid at the feet of these people, on the hearts of these people. Some will grow, some won't. Some will sprout and produce fruit. Some will begin to grow and wither and die. And others, I suppose, will be scooped up by, well, what does the parable say? By the birds, which are really Satan, and carried away before anything good happens. I want you to understand that these Mormon people all around you are as beautiful and sincere and good as is Chloe. And they deserve our love and our compassion, and they deserve our patience as they try to walk from the chains that bind them and hold them down. I'm Lance Earl. I'll see you soon.